John Busby with the Culture Buzz and uh, joining us in the studio today, one of our good time friends. Uh, I always love to find out what kind of creative mischief this guy is up to. Uh, and that right there should let you know that I am obviously talking to someone, Christian Day by name, who is kind of filmmaker, entrepreneur, but mainly he's a catalyst. He makes things happen in a very positive way. And uh, he is one of the shining uh, bright stars here in our greater Des Moines and Iowa community. And um, he keeps on making things happen. Uh, I was uh, honored to be part of his recent uh, uh, documentary, uh, Hybrid Pioneer, uh, and uh, that is really fun. Uh, even with me in it, the thing is getting uh, some very strong and good response. But it, it, it's a uh, it's always a pleasure to talk about and promote and let you folks know what this uh, uh, artist is doing because uh, it's always fascinating. Um, and he is one of those examples I like to use of someone who does not set any kind of boundaries for himself. Instead, he says, see, he wants to see how far he can reach out there. And his reach is global at this point. And now it's going to become pervasive because uh, people are going to, it's kind of like you know, you set something over in this far country and they start, Christian Day, Christian Day, Christian Day. And then everyone's chanting Christian Day it becomes a, a, a mantra when you're doing yoga almost uh, for some of these people. But uh, uh, the other person that's in the studio and we just met is kind of like, we're kindred spirits, I think, but Baron Christian is uh, 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 someone who's been entrenched in the acting community in Hollywood, around the world. Uh, as you, as our conversation unfolds, you're going to find out a little more about his background, and you're going to do that kind of palm on the forehead, oh yeah, now I remember type thing. But most importantly, we're going to talk about what Baron's doing for about a week, week and a half here in Iowa working with Christian Day. And so it's just like Baron Christian, Christian Day. So now I have to find someone whose name starts with Day, I guess, to you know get on crew here so we can keep this thread going. But it's, a, it's an honor and pleasure to have you both here because uh, uh, these are the kind of conversations I love because I know very little about this project other than if Christian Day is involved, it's got to be something that I want to know about and that you're going to want to know about. And so we get to learn together. And that in and of itself is a wondrous thing, folks. So thanks so much for uh, taking time out of your schedule. I understand that um, you're up at uh, the Templeton Rye uh, home ground where many people make a pilgrimage as often as possible. Yeah, we, uh, we were actually up there uh, yesterday. I picked up Baron from the Omaha airport and um, the executive producers for the film, um, Capone's Whiskey, the story of Templeton Rye, um, said, hey, you know, why don't you guys just make a quick trek up here right, instead of going straight to Des Moines? So we went up there and uh, we didn't leave until about 12.30 this morning <laughs> to come back down to Des Moines. And uh, Barron uh, actually got a tour of the town and some of the, um, I guess, the, the hallmarks, the spots, the places where people would hide whiskey and things like that. And, uh, um, you know, every time we go up there, it's it's almost like a family welcoming us, you know, back into town. You know, you feel very warm. And, you know, Barron had never been up there before. And, uh, you know... I guess I don't want to speak for you on this, but, uh, you know, they they actually just took him in like he was one of their own. It was fantastic. And, um, you know, this whole project has been just it's been a, a, a creature of its own. But it's it's probably the most warm project I've ever worked on that you actually feel connected. I've never worked with, um, you know, my executive producers. I've never worked with anyone that had such a personal and not necessarily non uh, more of a. Uh, I guess there's a, a true democracy with this project. Everything we we discuss, everything, and uh, they want the best thing for the story. I mean, this is a part of Iowa history. Well, now that the Templeton story has done the Phoenix routine and people are embracing its history, I think now is the time when those people who were connected, either directly, which there aren't that many left, uh, or through second and third generation and you know, second level storytelling. They want the right story to be told out there because it does have that dash, that flair that, which is wonderfully non-Iowan. <laughs> it's, 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 it's amazing to think, you know, that uh, the kind of quintessential image of the Iowan hardworking, honest, straightforward, uh, da, 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 this and that, you know, there was this community of bootleggers that uh, people were traveling hundreds of miles from Chicago to get the good stuff. 
Yeah, and, and, and this was actually a conversation. I did one interview last night, and I even I, I brought up uh, this idea that during e- hard economic times, we were comparing the 20s with uh, today. We talk about bad economy, recession, and we kind of just sit in it. Well, you, we go back to the 20s, these people didn't just sit in it. They just they knew what they were doing was very illegal, but it's either do this or, or perish. Or perish exactly. When <laughs> grain is going for three cents a bushel, you can't feed a family off that. When you can make whiskey and sell it for five dollars a bottle, now five dollars a bottle is quite a bit of money for back then. And if they're bringing in thirty bucks a week, you know that's huge. But the amazing thing is they were bringing in this type of money, but they weren't necessarily spending it. You know, a lot of these people are still doing pretty well after all these years from making whiskey. And it's, it's an Iowa tradition that we overlook. We, we think about the store product, the stuff that we can buy you know, or tr- attempt to buy. And there's all this mystique behind it. But, you know, there's so much heart in this story. Um, you know, I, I'll even say our tagline on this. The story is worth more than the recipe. <laughs> I like it. Well, it, and again, uh, I did some research when I was uh, producing a, a brew festival back in the 90s before we were doing the big one downtown. And one thing I discovered is that in the 1800s, at one point, there were over 280 breweries in Iowa. It's the same kind of thing where, you know, uh, self-sufficiency. Uh, so we do ultimately come back to some of the Iowa Hallmark uh, traits. And uh, this is self-sufficiency. I will survive. Uh, I, I'm not killing people in the process, so it can't be too bad. And well, uh, yeah. On, on, on the product side of it, you know, the product that you can purchase since the, 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 the I guess we would call the, uh, the return of Templeton Rye, um, it's a very high class top shelf booze. You know, people stand, you know, when you at a high V, if they see a case of it, when you can see a case of it, it doesn't even make it to the shelf. Um, they're on, you know, they're on allocation. It's one case per, you know, business or retailer. Um, and high V does the, has the deal where it's one bottle per customer. You know, it's Mystique. A, it's a very, yeah, I it, love it's it. continued on from the illegal world to the legal world. Which is very well, I think it's fun. Well, let's get to uh, this wondrous uh, person you brought into the project. And we have to, of course, at least once use his birth name, which is Donald Mark Baron Rolf Christian Mountbatten Battenberg. I tell you, I mean, uh, at grade school, you must have had a hell of a time trying to fill in those little squares and when you did the <laughs> tests and stuff. That That's quite a handle because you were born, of course, uh, as they say, across the pond. But... Um, uh, this has been home for a long, long time, hasn't it? It has been. I've been here since uh, five, five years of age and sent back there for a bit of education. You know why my mother gave me all of those names? Please, tell us. They were all names of wealthy relatives, and she figured if one of them croaked, that because I was a namesake, I would, <laughs> uh, didn't work, but it was a good idea to begin, but it didn't work. Well, if nothing else, it's one great conversation opener. Well, you know, you know, this is my name, but go ahead, call me Baron. Yes, there you go. <laughs> well, I, I, I need to find out, because I always love the backstories on how people become connected on great creative projects like this. And so, uh, please, uh, inform us. Well, um, someone had told me about this brilliant young fellow who was studying sound engineering, and uh, I said, that's, that's nice. What I need is another person in, in the business, connected with the business. I really didn't. But uh, this fellow kept saying, no, no, he's special. No, he's, he's really remarkable. So finally I said, what the hell? And I went in, in incognito. He was working at a um, sort of a quickie mart type of a uh, place where you could get gas and that sort of thing. I walked in and uh, heard him talking with customers. He was very articulate. And uh, so I sat down, had, had, had a Coke, talk, talked with my friend who had recommended him and stuff. I ran out of Coke and I went over and I said, may I have a refill? And he said, no. And I said, but all of these places give refills. He says, not this one. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, okay. I worked out with, uh, with this other fellow, his name was Aaron Long, and, and said, uh, well, he's very brilliant, but he does have an attitude problem. <laughs> and uh, 
Aaron says, no, 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 you've got to come back in. And then uh, I was introduced to him, and uh, we sort of hit it off like that. And uh, every time I'm over at his place and I want uh, more tea, he goes, no. <laughs> so, and he, but, but I have seen uh, Christian grow like a uh, rocket, really. Uh, it, it's amazing. He just, he just steps up and up and up and up. He seems to be the golden boy. He, he can't do anything wrong. And he's so brilliant for his age, I have accused him of uh, channeling Cecil B. DeMille or Otto Preminger or one of those because there's no way that he can know what he knows. Even though he's a voracious reader, there's no way he can know this. It's just a natural sense of production. He obviously has a much stronger connection to his previous lives than most of us. No, no question. Oh. Well, uh, now, now for this particular project, uh, wh what are we going to be able to see you doing? Well, or hear doing, you doing, or whatever. Well, I'll be doing some some narration and voiceovers, but uh, Christian uh, has talked me into doing some on camera stuff, and uh, he comes up with very creative ways of shooting a scene. And apparently, what we're going to do is we'll be in a darkened room, and with sort of uh, dramatic lighting on either side of the face, and I'll be in a suit. In this humidity, I'll be in a suit. When, we're, when you're shooting, you can't use air conditioning because of the, the sound. And I'll be uh, doing some serious um, talking about it as though, well, it, it's like narration, but a, drama a more dramatic read because you're on camera and stuff. It should be fun. Yeah, the idea came from, um, I watched a documentary about uh, screenwriter Trumbo who was blacklisted. Um, he wrote the screenplay for uh, Johnny Got His Gun. And um, during the big uh, Red Scare, um, he lost a lot of his friends, and uh, they, this documentary that was made about him just in the last 10 years, instead of having a, a regular narrator, they had different actors, including Nathan Lane, Liam Nielsen, and they were reading from his journal, um, talking about how he would never betray his friends, things like that, and how the business who, some of these people who he thought were his friends were turning him in in order to save their own skin during the big red scare. And I saw this and I thought, you know, my approach to filmmaking is very different. I, you know, I come from that, uh, that kind of punk rock background. You know, I want to make something that doesn't just appeal to your standard, you know, uh, I, don't know I don't want to make an industrial or a, a real simple documentary. I want it to be, appeal to all age groups. And when um, I saw this, I saw bingo, this is how we can approach this. So we have a collection of um, old... Uh, uh, newspaper articles from the 20s and the 30s um, that he's actually going to be reading segments of, um, some journal entries from some of the bootleggers, um, random thoughts that they have, and it's just going to kind of uh, drive the story. We have stuff from back in the 20s and stuff more recently, um, you know, some, some really good stuff. And I thought, you know, <laughs> this would be perfect if we put him in an old brick room, give him a nice fedora, you know, have a mason jar, and have him telling these stories. And it drives the rest of the picture as we go through these different eras of Templeton Rye. Because, you know, there's not just the 20s and Prohibition, and there's not just the, the, the product that's on the shelf since that started. There's a whole section that we've kind of left alone, you know, because you know, it wasn't of uh, top interest. So you're missing the 90s, the 80s, the 60s, 70s, you know. Well, Iowa went through its own uh, um, evolution uh, post-Prohibition, too, because... Uh, you're way too young to remember this, but it wasn't until around 1960 when they introduced the state liquor stores and then you couldn't uh, buy liquor by the drink and all this other arcane type stupid rules and laws. But it went through that, so I could imagine a lot of people went directly to the maker. And it's, it's funny that you mentioned that. We've uh, interviewed, um, and it's, a lot of these guys are in their 90s now, um, guys who used to bring in Coors illegally, and uh, it's funny how around 1960, 1962, a lot of these guys were bringing in booze illegally, like beer and such, but then 63 is when um, the, the, the state uh, sale started, and then around 1964, 1965, all of a sudden all these guys who were bootleggers had their own uh, distribution companies. Because they had all these connections from doing it illegally. <laughs> and I feel like we miss that now with entrepreneurship. You know. We, we miss that edge with people, you know. Yep. 
I, I, I feel, and I, and I hope at some point I kind of still kind of, I try to carry that, especially when I'm stealing shots illegally, you know, taking my camera. And that's why I, I the way I do my <laughs> films, I mean, you experienced it when I came in here, you know, and I'm sure when Brent asked you, hey, would you like to be part of Hybrid Pioneer? You know, here I come with the camera, basically steal the shot, we're in and out in 20 minutes. Right, you know, you got me at my ugliest, but that's and, okay. And you bookmark it; you totally bookmark it. You got you at the beginning, we got you at the end. You got a, you got a great opening statement, and you have a great closing statement. And well, I try to carry that style in some, you know, in some sense into my other projects. But again, this is also a you know, whereas Hybrid Pioneer was um, I work for you know a labor of love. I made it for around two hundred dollars and my own money. This is obviously a, this is a funded project. Um, there, we, there's a lot more time and care involved with it because we can take our time, but without losing, you know, that gorilla edge that I like to still, you know, include in there because it, it, it captures the eye of a lot of the, I guess, I feel like the, a lot of the more of the, um, the arts culture, some of the younger generation likes that uh, cinema, it's a thing it's called a uh, cinema verte style. So, you know, you still got that very nice, elegant, professional style, but then you kind of give it a little bit of a sharper edge. Well, something you may not have thought about, but it just simply just keeps resonating in my skull is the fact that with this kind of film and with you driving the film project, uh, I can't help but thinking that this younger generation, the younger generations now are going to think, well, gosh, what what other kind of gold mines are waiting there to be tapped in the history of Iowa? And uh, I you know I have a passion for history, so um, it, it's just, I think, a great way to reconnect with history that a lot of people haven't been thinking about. They don't teach history in the schools, but through cinema, what a great gateway. Well, and Hybrid Pioneer opened up a door for me when I came up with a series called the Made in Iowa documentary series where you take something that's Iowa-based, and it needs to be marked, I have to be able to market it outside of Iowa, because it's not that I'm, and you know, I want Iowans to love it, but it's not your audience is not necessarily Iowa. Um, it's everyone outside of the state because I, I, I give this speech quite often when, when when I did my four rooms exhibit down at Finders Creepers. I said we have a great art scene. We have created this amazing scene. However, we've made a great scene for ourselves, and we need to make a scene that people from the outside want to come in and see. Um, Hybrid Pioneer, as it was came out last week, we won uh, best foreign documentary at the DIY Film Festival in Poland. That was the, exactly what I wanted to see. Sure. The European market is huge, and it's also taking something from our, what we feel is almost like our small niche, and taking it to a much broader audience, a bigger audience. Well, what you exemplify in my mind, Christian, is what uh, I will continue to champion until they push me under and I'm pushing up daisies, and that is we need to find those creative products we can export to bigger markets because that is how we in turn are going to get the resources and support that we need to build a stronger creative base here. Because I think I've told you this before, but Robert Bluestone, a classical guitarist from Arizona, was up here and his tagline now is creativity is the capital of the 21st century. And I love that concept because that is something we can uh, nurture here within the state of Iowa let's face it, we're not going to be making washing machines and vacuum cleaners too much in the future. So let's start making creativity. Let's use that as our stuff. And yes, I agree with the, the, the bio agricultural fronts and those kind of things, but all those sciences, they, they have a core of creativity. So let's also infuse culture, arts, cinema, those kind of aspects. And yes, it is selfish. Our daughter is, um, wrapping up her degrees. One of them is going to be in cinematography at the University of Iowa. She's going to go out to Hollywood to do hands-on work and training with people we know out there. But we want her to stay strongly connected with Iowa because there's a love of what is happening here. And as we've talked about before, there's an ability to access resources in Iowa that few other states and major communities really have. If you right. want to talk to the, the top dog in the greater Des Moines community, as long as it's not something that's just time wasting, you're going to be able to talk to that person. It's great. You know, we, what I feel that we really need is we have a lot of creative, but we need more business to back the creative. With cinema, I feel that people still think of it as a possibly a hobby. And as I discussed in an email with you when I told you that Baron was coming to town, he comes from a generation of Hollywood that I wish was still there. You know, people who love to work. 
And and as you'll you, you you'll talk about, I'm sure with, uh, you know, the pay was good, but it's not ridiculous like it is now. And when you know here we talk about tax credit and such, California doesn't offer anything. I don't think maybe 20 percent for people, but they don't offer anything. But all the work is there because they're all there. If we had a, a good understanding on the business level of film here, and I'm not talking commercials, I'm not talking about industrials, PSAs, or whatever, film and understanding what it can do and having that mentality and having business people understand uh, you know with my company modern american cinema we have we have our own business plan every film has a business plan and how we're going to market it if we got more people kind of involved on that level i think we could have a, a very very strong industry here because we have the creative now we just need more of the business yeah i love it because when we start talking we start wandering from the initial creative path but let's get back to the Templeton project. But because I want to uh, come back to to you, Baron, just to kind of as we r- kind of close down our conversation here. Um, uh, this is a mutual admiration society, but it's well founded, so that's good. But uh, what are some of the fun things you're you're kind of jazzed about when it comes to getting involved in this project? Well, first of all, <clears throat> I had heard that it is a documentary, and I've narrated documentaries before. Uh, quite a bit. As a matter of fact, uh, one won uh, an Oscar, an Academy Award in '96, called "A Story of Healing," uh, that I was involved with. Luckily, but then this began to grow. I know Christian. I know kind of his modus operandi, and it's it's wonderful. I live vicariously through him since I, you know, sort of uh, retired from the business. But it became more than a documentary. It's actually becoming a feature film without uh, actors and a plot. Oh, it actually does have a plot, doesn't it? But it's just, uh, it becomes bigger and bigger and more exciting and more exciting. So I'm, I'm pretty psyched about that. Well, with your experience in the industry, and you, you are a great observer, uh, and I can say that a lot of people who are in the industry aren't necessarily good observers, but you are. So uh, this is, I'm, I'm tossing you an easy softball you're going to hit out of the park, but uh, this has got to be energizing for you to see this new style of filmmaker come along and to be part of this. Absolutely true, even, even though it's a small part. Uh, it's, it's fun to see. Well, basically, I think that Christian is, is on the uh, cutting edge. I think he's uh, at the uh, top of the wave. And he represents what is happening and what is going to happen. Also, I'm not sure if you're familiar with his scoring, but it is not a typical scoring at all. It is very... Again, it's very cutting edge. It's what uh, the future is going to be. It's what some of the filmmakers are looking for and using right now. He scored a number of motion pictures. And it's very strange and uh, atmospheric and moving, and yet you don't quite know why you're feeling this. Kind kind of subliminal, yet when you roll the track uh, yourself, it's, it's, uh, it's very beautiful. Very, uh, I don't even know how to describe it. Cutting edge would, would work. Well, uh, we're going to wrap up, uh, and you know, I, I've done something that I f- usually do early in our conversations, and that's you. Some of you people are out there going nuts because I usually try to make sure I have a way to guide you to a website or something like that. I'm going to let Christian wrap this up by uh, giving the name of this project and his website, so you can connect with this uh, young man. And um, uh, regardless from the fact that I've been involved in one of his projects. Uh, you know me, I, arts is a contact sport, and so I'm going to be involved in projects, and, but it doesn't mean it's a, it's a biased praise that I am heaping on here. Uh, I do have a very careful way of observing people, and so if you hear me not say anything about someone, then you can figure that out, okay? But uh, Christian, please help us wrap up by giving folks again that hint so they can be salivating for when this film will finally be released to the world, and then they can follow it probably through your website and other media, correct? Uh, Well, the name of the film is Capone's Whiskey, the story of Templeton Rye. Um, You can uh, find uh, most of the update information on imdb.com, or you can go to www.christianday.com. And uh, or just uh, Google search my name. You'll. Um, I'm trying to push this very hard, so there's always new information coming out about it. And make sure you start Christian with a K and not a CH, and that will help the search process <laughs> immensely. <laughs> well, this is definitely the start of a dialogue. I look forward to hearing more. Maybe we'll get updates from Baron as this project goes along. 
Uh, definitely we'll get updates from Christian, uh, but the process will be delightful to watch and uh, take pride in uh, an Iowa nurtured project that we will eventually be able to export, uh, not just on a monetary basis, but also people going, my gosh, what are they doing there in Iowa? This is fantastic. That's the way it's supposed to be. Thank you, gentlemen, both. Thank you. My pleasure.